This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, welcome to the board game side of everything. I already made the RPG episode and put that up. I had some difficulty, so there are a couple of hours in between, rather than getting one up right after the other. But I think I got it fixed. And uh, you should be seeing this uh, in the general time frame of when I usually get stuff out. There are some campaigns that are closing out pretty quickly. Um, I don't think all of them are going to fund, so you might have time for them to come back around. And we'll just continue talking about the stuff we talk about with all the board games, card games, skirmish game, war games, all that kind of good stuff. But if you were looking for anything 3D printed or for an RPG or for some dice or other crazy cool stuff, you should check out the other episode, which I will link to in the description. And at the end of this episode, where you see all of the uh, little pictures pop up, one of them will be for the RPG episode from this week and for last week's episode, so you can catch up on everything that's still going on. July is very busy. June was pretty busy, but uh, now we're getting to the point where I'm having to do... <clears throat> what's it been? In the last three weeks, I've had to do five videos just to get through everything, so quite a bit of stuff. Hope everybody's making new friends. Things are opening up this week, so hope you uh, stay safe, stay clean, all that kind of goodness and uh, find a new person to invite into your circle so you can all have a good time. Why not? We've all been stuck inside. It's a good time to meet more people. And one of these that uh, we're looking at right now is Tuning Madness. This is a Formula One game. We're supposed to be racing around a track. There are some issues with it, and that's probably why it's not going to fund this time around. But if you're interested in the look of it or this type of game, follow the creator, contact them, and you'll be contacted when it goes back up, because most of the time they do. Hopefully with some fixes. If I had to fix anything about this game and campaign, they're not offering the cars. They're like, oh, you can bring any of your regular uh, 164th scale cars and play it on this thing. For 80 euros, not getting cars is a very bad value. Um, and the only reason a lot of people pick up these types of games is to also have the models or cars and things that it comes with. So that is very, very unfortunate, especially when there is an option for it, but it's 100 euros to get 3D printed versions of the cars. Um, as, a, as a business side, you got to think pretty hard as to what a buyer is actually getting, not just how much things are going to cost you. And uh, I hope they come out with a way to come up with a much lower priced product that allows you to print it yourself. And they'll get a lot more, uh, more attention that way. Now we turn our attention to the ultimate end of all things, death, as Abraham Simpson would say. This is The Little Death, the game, and it is a game that was popular in France. They sold nearly 20,000 copies in France alone, and they're ready to go to the U.S. It hasn't been doing that level of success, but I think it's just because people don't know too much about it. The art is pretty neat. It's, uh, it feels a little Pip-Boy in the Fallout world. It's not post-apocalyptic, it's not exactly to that standard of, of artwork, but it has that kind of feel to it, where all this craziness that's going on in this world, all the terrible uh, death and destruction that's going on, but you still have a cute uh, dude trying to hold up the whole thing as you go through. You play a Reaper, and you get all these little cute little colored Reapers to play uh, as your Reaper meeples. Reaples? Whatever you want to call them. And um, you get to play various types of people such as you can see there in the graphic they've got unicorns you have to kill you have uh, I think that's supposed to be Kurt Cobain Lemmy and uh, Einstein not a hundred percent on that but I think that's what it's supposed to be you have to find English or er, interesting ways to uh, kill all of these uh, famous individuals and uh, I think it's a it's a dark but it's not too soon uh, you know of a concept you know I think they're they're pretty good and it could be a lot of fun. And then we have Inbox Zero, or Zero Inbox, which is a game for people that work in an office. And I'll tell you a quick story about Office Space. I try to get my friends to watch it, and they had not had office jobs yet, and I had. And I thought it was hilarious, and they thought it was dumb. And then they got jobs, and they saw the world from an entirely different point of view, and that it was the genius that it was. Now, that's going to happen in this type of game. If you're dealing with a bunch of people that don't have to struggle with uh, inter-office problems, the fax machine, or any of that other kind of business, they're not the party for this. Go best with some people that are stuck in cubicles, and they're going to have a really good time. you got different types of attack, attack cards, 
uh, in the sense of annoying your your various um, coworkers and generating problems for them as uh, you try to get all of your tasks done and get down to that zero inbox world. It seems pretty neat. Uh, I think I would enjoy it. But one of the hard things about having games as a hobby is to escape work. So it might not be for everybody. And then a couple decades ago, a friend of mine, he had this game on some console and he had all the consoles. So there's no way to tell which one it was that allowed you to play a car that was just finding the best way to get wrecked. And that's what this game is like. Uh, this one's called Crash and you use various cars, uh, cards to create various cars and do the most damage possible by crashing into things. Um, I think the game was Burnout, maybe? It was something like that. It, might, it was probably on a PlayStation. It might have been on Xbox. But uh, if that's what you're into, if you're into that um, <clears throat> kind of a... It's a, it's, a, it's a derby. I forget the name of it. We went to it at uh, Saga Speedway a couple times. And they go in figure eights and, and other stuff, and they crash into the various cars, and they take old beaters out. And sometimes they'll do like a like a car version of a human centipede and put three of them together and only the front one can steer and all this crazy stuff happens in the back ones. Demolition Derby, that's the word I'm looking for. And it's not quite that, but uh, it is in that kind of vein. You're just going to run in and crazy cabbie or whatever into uh, another group or car or whatever and mount up the points. If you're not offended by that, I know there was some controversy when those types of games came out. They didn't want to train teenagers to crash into things. But that's up to you. I don't think a board game is going to be too too much of an influence. And last week, I think we had a very crunchy baseball game. This is a little less so. There is some artwork involved. And it is Dead Ball Year 4. We've looked at the previous campaigns for the other years. Um, WM Makers, I remember the name and the artwork from a, few, uh, a while back. This is one of those where the stats of the game is basically how everything runs, but this one also has dice and other stuff that comes along with it to uh, change the game up quite a bit. They do not offer a lot of artwork uh, for people like me to help promote the game. Maybe they'll change that in the future, but uh, as you can see, it is something from the past brought up to today's standard that you can play especially if other sports have been canceled maybe you want to pick it up as this is year four and they do have previous years you can pick up as well then we have a set collection game of curios this is the whatnot cabinet and you have colors you've got shapes you've got different types of things and you were trying to figure out the best and most beautiful cabinet possible to throw together to keep all of your stuff if you're into shelfy organization then uh, maybe this is a game for you. If you want to try to uh, organize your thoughts by organizing flowers, butterflies, birds, and other stuff, maybe it will be a good way to like figure out where to put your wingspans, your photosynthesis, uh, I don't know, potion explosion. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you would put for the snails. But there's a lot of ideas that you could throw there and exercise your organizational abilities in your mind before you clean up your house. Then if you just need a simple dungeon crawl, that's what Mini Rogue is about. It has uh, a very clean design. I know that there is a technical term for this design style. It's like what you get on the Infographics YouTube show. Um, it, there's not a lot of detail put into everything, but it's there. It still looks pretty neat, and you do get some level of highlights and shadows, but for the most part, it's a very flat design in uh, how everything is uh, shown to you. You can't see a lot of the artwork here, so you might have to go in to check it out. But otherwise, this is a card game out of France, and it is uh, basically running through a uh, newly generated dungeon, taking various paths and looking for a skeleton king-looking monster majig thing. And uh, it's got a couple of big old swords, and you got to fight it with whatever skills that you picked up along the way. Each time you play should be different, and that's what the roguelikes are for, right? It's supposed to be like those video games. Then don't let the name fool you. This is not about the country of Trinidad. This is about Ciudad de la Santísima Trinidad. It is the former name of Buenos Aires. So you have a colony that has collapsed in 1580. And you're doing everything you can to recreate it. So the people that are behind this have been known to do very heavy strategy games. And they're saying that this is going to be the same case. Um, they don't go too cartoony on any of the 3D printed stuff or any of the, the minis. They all like like uh, interesting pirates and uh, other types of conquistadors. 
So uh, I would expect to be able to use these minis over, which is a nice thing to have. They have no less than six regular citizens and uh, natives. I don't want to call them Indians, but that's what they're referred to as Indios. And I think this is a terrible term because they're not from India. Um, anyway, they got warriors and they have those uh, um, the wooden swords attached to them. They talked about uh, on the uh, two or three previous uh, uh, ones ago when the... Uh, cool Mini or Not has the new um, comic books that go with uh, uh, Zombicide. And uh, one of the characters has those obsidian-laced wooden swords. The minis, I think, are awesome. But uh, this is also going to be a game that should keep you involved for quite a while with the strategy. And uh, I just didn't wish it didn't wasn't called Trinidad because it's confusing. Buenos Aires, why not? And then we have a couple of negatives on this Zodiac Awakening core game. Zodiac Awakening, what does it mean? Core, what does that mean? Um, protect your core. Well, it also means that it's the beginning of a box and you expand out from there. So what does all that to go together? Zodiac Awakening, what's that? Well, oh, it's uh, some type of book series. All right, 27 people have backed this so far. Part of that is because the name is confusing. Um, if it is about the Zodiac Awakening series, Core is not a good uh, sub name to go along with it. It needs to be more expressive of what is happening. Is this a battling game? Is it a collection game? What is it? Core means nothing other than it's going to be expanded. Are you missing something? Is something else going to be there? Is it just the core? Lots of questions. And then we got to talk about the art. The actual celestial types, that part's fine, but there needs to be some more shadows and gradients and things to fill out the uh, one on the right, as you can see, Consi if that's how you're supposed to pronounce it. When compared to other things and the other artwork that you see out there, it's just too simple, I think, and um, and that's going to be definitely hurting this game. But uh, if you're a fan of this series, I can see why you'd want to jump in on it. Um, tell your friends, if you're a fan of this series, that there's also going to be this game, or maybe even pick up extras, because otherwise it's not going to get funded. But art is not the problem here at all for Legends of Signum. This is the second set of uh, creatures for this war game. You can use this art in any fantasy RPG that you want. They are very similar to uh, things that you're going to find in the most popular RPGs. L like that fairy dragon that happens to be right there. You could toss that very easily into a D&D &D campaign. There are some brilliantly uh, crafted miniatures, sculpted... Uh, painted in the video and all that kind of cool stuff going on. The game itself seems to be just a typical war game. You place your folks out, you measure it with rulers, and you blow each other up in the best way possible. So they have spider elves, um, like drow, right? They worship spiders. Um, and you have a bunch of other cool stuff, different types of witches, different types of werewolves, and whatever other craziness. So I think you can utilize this game in a lot of different ways with a lot of other content you already own. And then one of the reasons I don't like to do all these separated out episodes is because I miss one. This was a Beowulf Age of Heroes 5th edition Dungeons and Dragon Mythic setting. And it should have gone on the other channel, but you know what? It's here. You can check it out. Beowulf is the oldest English language poem out there. And you can't read it as if it were modern English because it's not in modern English, but it is in the language of the people that were in England. And... It is one of the most underutilized fantasy properties out there. Yeah, they got the 3D movie that was out there that uh, had Ray Winstone as the voice and he looked like Thor and all that kind of cool stuff with uh, Angelina Jolie as Grendel's mom. You have the Seamus Haney translation, which is the best one that I've ever seen. It does not take a whole lot to, uh, to get through and it is a wonderful translation. But what do you do after that? What do you do with all of the, the shieldlings and other crazy folk that are in there well make a DD campaign about it because it's got all the things you need it's got kings and heroes and monsters and crazy long periods of time that uh, all of those sins come back to haunt you so i'd say if you can give it a shot jump in read beowulf the seamus haney version and then read a beowulf age of heroes and play through and uh, mess up some monsters and we have a strategy game that takes the entire World War II European theater, condenses it down to eight hours, or one to eight hours, 
and it can be played from one to three people. That is awesome. North Africa is even included in all this cool stuff. It doesn't call itself a war game, but you know it's got all the cubes and everything that makes it look like one of those typical uh, strategy war games that we see every week. Um, yeah, if you're a number cruncher, if uh, you don't mind the cubes instead of having minis and that kind of stuff, this may be a great way to get started. I like the idea of being able to play in only an hour, and uh, having one to three players is awesome because a lot of times you have a minimum of two players, so this is something that you can at least play solo. Now, I'll be honest, I don't typically use Tamiya model paints because I have so many other types of acrylics. Um, the uh, main thing being I use the uh, regular uh, the cement, the thin cement. That's what I use on all my Kingdom Best stuff and whatever else needs to be repaired. So it's a good brand. And you may be a fan of that brand. And you've hated the little jars that it comes in because you haven't been able to really utilize it or in a clean way drop it on your palette so that you can paint whatever you need to paint. Drop top. That is what this is about. These are tops so you can put them on your Tommy stuff and uh, have a little dab pop out one at a time. There was a similar campaign for GW uh, stuff we did, I would say, four months ago. Um, so th these are very handy things to have if you like the dropper uh, style. Now, they've got a long way to go. They've got just under three weeks to get there. Uh, so if it takes them a while, it's totally possible that uh, they may need a couple of rounds of funding. Just stick with them, follow the creator, and uh, you know, get follow the project. And if it does get brought back up again, I'll try to remind you guys. But this is something that a lot of people will find very, very useful. It's just a matter of catching enough people that will also see it. And we have Sea of Plunder. This, from what I can tell, is a means of moving a merchant ship towards a treasure area on the map. And there are these roaming pirates that are also on the grid. And you pull cards that can push or pull your opponents to and from those uh, perils like the, the pirates and other stuff you can run into. Simple enough game, not too expensive, uh, it's not too violent. I mean you can get caught up by pirates but it uh, has no real gore to it or anything like that so if uh, maybe you have a group that is very nautically themed, uh, Ghost of Salt March or Bilgewater or whatever other uh, things, um, is a little too complex for your, your uh, family or group and you still want something to be able to play with them that is sea-based then maybe this is just easy enough to keep going although you got a little tiny meeples and they show a lot of uh, kids playing the game along with them I would say just make sure you're not gonna have all the kids that they put in the video because one of them could swallow these little meeple guys small parts people small parts and get ready for the bear puns, Tales of Barbaria. I like the title the first time. <laughs> hundred times in, I might get bored. There are a lot of bear puns all over this game. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to roll some dice. Those dice are going to give you values. Those values are going to let you perform certain tasks. And as those tasks are completed, you get points. That's it. You have a fantasy world that is bear-themed. You have zombie bears, you have, uh, you know, just a bunch of crazy Ewok looking <laughs> um, uh, bears thrown in there. Very much of that same um, infogra uh, infographics channel style. Uh, I don't know what else to call it. Uh, it's a little bit anime themed, but um, not 100% in that category. Cute, but, you know, there's weapons and things in there as well. You can have it with people that love to have a particular color because that's all they're going to get is a different color dye. Great on that end for kids and they can learn different things about like how to use the market and how to save for later when they have to hibernate. Uh, that is a pun from the actual game and video. Yeah. Then we have a pun from a different language. This is Formal Fun, like Formal Un or Formal One, like Formula One Racing. This is another racing game, but this one gives you the meeples and prices accordingly. So just like you're going around a track and having to do the race using cards, this one is a little bit better at uh, making sure that it's going to be a value for your money. 
Now, they have lots of different uh, types of uh, hazards that you can run into. So you can see there's like night, day, wet, dry, all those different types of conditions. The cars look like something from uh, early in the previous century, uh, not necessarily something that would be uh, current as far as the, the little car meeples go. Maybe you'd want to trade those up with some micro machines. That would be awesome. But uh, otherwise, you've got these little wooden guys, and uh, they should last you for quite a while. Simple game, easy to put together, and easy to play, all that kind of cool stuff. And, uh, you know, I would say of the racing games that have so far been in the episode, this is probably the one with the most promise to, uh, to actually make it to your door. Then there is Messenger, an immersive mystery, and I am always skeptical about these um, puzzles in a box it's hard to know if they're going to be actual good puzzles and it makes sense the the clues and where they lead you a lot of times they don't and there's just too much assumption of uh, that they'll get to a certain place but there's no real logic to it um, I'm not going to say that that's the case here I'm going to say that I don't know and that's what I worry about with every single one of these the only real worry I have here is it has a cassette it also comes with a USB drive but do you have a working cassette player? I don't anymore. Um, my dad might, right? Somewhere locked in a box, and uh, who knows what condition it's going to be in. But cassettes, unless you have a car from 20 years ago, there's no guarantee it's going to be accessible to you. And are you going to get into somebody's old car in order to listen to this cassette tape? I think that's a bit of bad design. Um, you could throw a CD in there. You can mark it the same way. Uh, just don't mark it with uh, masking tape because it'll throw off the the way that it balances. But you know they could write on it with a marker, same as what's what's there, and it would be just as effective. So just make sure you can use all of the tools if you decide to pick this up. That's what I'm getting at. Then we have on the square. This is about the first three degrees of being a Freemason which no one is supposed to know about if you're a Freemason. You're supposed to not reveal this kind of thing on punishment of death, right? That's what you swear to when you're part of it. My grandfather was a Freemason. I have not yet joined any of those types of things because I don't qualify. But uh, what you need is to, at the minimum, keep your mouth shut. So I'm wondering what this would even be about. I know it's just a boys club. They try to figure out some charitable works, different things to do. Most of the time, they just try to figure out what's for dinner or lunch. Um, I don't know if you end up working with the Daughters of the Evening Star, which is the female version, but otherwise, it is just a boys club. And I can't say that it would be very exciting. Um, it does look like some type of set collection game. And the exciting part may be based on how you move on this semi chessboard. Uh, look, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> like I said, it just doesn't seem like it would fit what the actual claim is because it's supposed to be from a secret society. Just as I talked about that secret society, my computer died and I had to do everything I could to recover it once again. It is no joke. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with the ocean either. This is open ocean. This is a tile laying game that uh, even offers a solo experience, which is great. I totally agree that ages 8 and up can probably play this game no problem all on their own. And they can learn a little bit about the ocean to go with it. We have many times talked about very similar games. So if there is anything out there, uh, I don't even remember the titles. There's been so many of them um, that can uh, you know, give a little bit of uh, wonder to kids. It's, they'll never be able to go out into outer space, but they will be able to go out into the ocean and see stuff and scuba dive if they are inclined to do so or you're inclined to take your kids to do that. 25-minute game, you know, something to keep their attention. Bright colors, very accessible. It's a very good option if you got kids. Now, if Sea of Plunder was a little too young skewing for you, that's what Salt in Sail is for. It's a more refined version of that kind of game in the sense that you have a little bit better artwork, a little more complexity, and you can make your own maps using the tiles that are there. You are still playing someone who is running around looking for treasure, and you're trying to avoid pirates as best you can. But you're not a pirate. You are just a regular adventurer looking for all the things that may be out there in the new world so 
If you're if you were intrigued by the previous one, maybe you'll be uh, a better fit for this one uh, for salt and sail instead. And uh, you know, enjoy uh, getting your discovery on. And then you might notice I've had a lot of energy on this episode. It's because I stopped and I got tacos. Tacos are amazing. They are like a drug, and they are awesome, and you should share them with folks. And if you ever run out of tacos, you can play Taco the Game. Why wouldn't you? It uh, comes in hard shell or soft, whatever it is that you choose. If you want to add guac, you do that to yourself, because it's in hard plastic, and it won't hurt it one tiny bit. Um, that's basically the way it is. You are competitive taco builders. It has uh, an abbreviation for Taunt, Attack, Conquer, and Obsess. That's not what taco really means, but... <laughs> You can, uh, you can play this just about anywhere with anyone. Just make sure they don't eat the pieces. It says ages 7 up. Um, I don't know. As long as they don't eat the pieces, then they, they'd probably be safe for it. Uh, you got little different types of ingredients. Um, they don't shy away from beef being a cow. Uh, and they do have some hot and uh, other types of stuff that you can throw on. Um, if you don't know what pico de gallo is, then you should because it is much better than sour cream or cheese to throw on a taco in just my California, uh, opinion, but that's up to you. And, uh, if you want to be able to find something that is a wonderful common denominator to create a game with and a game night about, just make sure you got a taco station ready to go along with it because everyone's going to be hungry. Then we have Tavern Brawl. This is a very simple 3D printed game that uh, pretty accurately emulates a street fight in a tavern of fantasy proportions. You've got uh, some neat little meeples you can see there on the bottom left. You have the guy with the sword, the bow, the daggers. I'm pretty sure those daggers are going to break off at that scale, though. And a wizard, or just a person with a staff and a cone hat. You can be whatever you want to be. You've got uh, regular the types of patrons that you can run across, and tables and chairs and the bar and everything just ready to go and uh, have a little bit of a fight it's all done with dice that's the type of game this is so if you're looking for a small game uh, that could be representative of your RPG uh, setup or you know just a tavern brawl all on its own that parts up to you then we have what is basically an old sci-fi movie with 3d brought to the card game world this is the dead eye and you use the red-blue stereoscopic glasses in order to see various things in 3D on these cards. It could make you go a little nuts or make, hurt, make your eyes hurt to look at the cards regularly or to always have the glasses on. So those are some options, you know, just things that you're going to have as obstacles uh, when you think about this game. If you do not have any issues with having to see uh, the two different sides of your eyes in different colors, then maybe this would be good for you. Um, it's neat to a degree. I mean, it's one way that you can make certain things on the cards remain secret is by having uh, them uh, behind things that only the glasses can see. And uh, otherwise, you know, you get yourself a sci-fi solo card adventure that, uh, you know, could be a lot of fun. And uh, it looks like it takes place in uh, like a mining colony or something like that. Mainly it's the gimmick of the glasses. And that's the only real warning I have is just make sure that you're not buying something that is going to hurt your eyeballs. Then we have a game that we covered very recently, and this was a game of acquisitions. This is based on the game Acquire, and you're just trying to get some coins. It is played through using that table there up in the upper right. You have different things that you can exchange, and you're going to go back and forth and try to get as many coins as you can. Um, then they're going to make some type of chess piece uh, looking buildings to be able to, I don't know, be some kind of stronghold. If you played the game of Acquire before, then this is just a fantasy version and you might want to jump in on it. It's a second round, third round, whatever it is through. It might need another one, uh, but it looks like it's about halfway to its goal and very well could be complete on this round of funding. Then we have Myths at War. This is a card game where you get to play for a lot of different types of mythologies. Normally you see Norse, Greek all the time. This also has some Japanese ones. Hindu, I'm not sure which Native American tribe that they're uh, going by, but they say they have some. I don't know which version of Voodoo, but they say they've got that. Sumerian, almost impossible to do Sumerian as there's no uh, actual translation for their stuff. But uh, they also have Chinese, Aztec, Roman, Persian, Greek, they say Transylvanian? Really? So 
So maybe it's just a bunch of Dracula stuff, because otherwise those folks were, uh, I think, Catholic, and then they became Muslim. So I'm not sure which one they'd be, but it says it's a supernatural setting, so I'm going to guess vampires and werewolves, as well as good old Lovecraftian stuff. So if you want to be able to fight them each other, against each other, apparently this thing is uh, it had over 500 tournaments, 20,000 units sold, it had a novel, a comic, 13 different expansions. Wow, lots of stuff, and now it's your opportunity to pick it up after all that crazy stuff has gone through. If you've got any fandom of any of these uh, types of gods and goddesses, uh, spirits or whatever, give this a shot. Then we have something a little less complicated, Pizza Rush. You lay down a pizza, you get whatever type you want, jumbo base, small base, whatever it's going to be. You throw down as many toppings as you can fit into it based on what's in your hand, and you score it. Simple, make you hungry, lots of neat stuff. Chili sauce, they throw down there. That's not the weirdest thing I've seen on a pizza. Tuna? The the pizza place that's been around me for 60 plus years. Tuna they're putting on there now? I don't know who's ordering this. I, I can't imagine that. Maybe same people like uh, sardines or whatnot, but tuna is just a little too fishy. Come on. Otherwise, hot sauce, pepperoni, cheese, mushrooms, whatever you like. Feel free to make that pizza, score it up, beat your friends, and then go order some pizza. All right, quick warning, this is the last family-friendly campaign before the next one, and that next one is going to be a little bit of a challenge based on the theme and everything. So if you've got kids, when I get to the end of this one, skip and go to the next one if you're, they're following along with. But if otherwise you have a uh, good, naughty sense of humor, feel free to carry along. And what's this one about, Pyramid of Khufu? It is in conjunction with a uh, Valindra Cancer Center UK. It is about Egyptian gods and goddesses. I just finished playing 100% uh, completion through uh, Assassin's Creed Origins, and it has a lot to do with these various gods. It is a fascinating world. It is not... Uh, it's not just one time period and, and everything's the same. It is got a lot of different uh, changes and things, uh, technologies that come in and uh, changes made by various gods and goddesses as you go through, but they maintain the uh, the art style very well uh, throughout this uh, game to be reflective of the things you might find in a pyramid. And, uh, you know, whatever has survived is right now probably in the UK anyway, <laughs> so it's not a bad place to get that source of info from. So if you're looking for a neat card game in the uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian realm, give this a go. Now we're going to go on to the next one, and it's a doozy. You've been warned. I love everything that lives on that fine line between odd and unacceptable, and that is Sin Pit, the erection of the golden nipple. This is a game that is just odd, and one of the oddest things about it it looks like it might be neat, and it looks like you could use the minis from it for a lot of different other modern style worlds. They have that anime style, they've got the big eyes and all that. Uh, there are mushroom people, and you don't have to paint everything like it's got nipples on it. Uh, but you can also order it, as shown here, fully painted if you feel embarrassed by painting it yourself. So uh, that part is great. These folks in Spain and Mutant Apple are nuts in the same way that South Park is nuts. This is just a regular tile laying game, doesn't have anything uh, particularly disgusting or uh, weird about it except for the fact of its names and a couple of the models uh, are going out of their way to include things that look like mammary glands and reproductive organs, whatever I can describe that isn't going to get this thing tossed off from the suggestions list. But it's out there. I think it's crazy in a kooky, in a great way. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's funny the same way Little Nicky was funny. Uh, last movie by Rodney Dangerfield. If you haven't seen it, you should, because Rodney Dangerfield is the man. That's all I got to say about it. It's neat. It's weird. It's kooky. And if you got friends with a sense of humor, it could be for them. Then, after that's over, we have a very strange game. This is Tales of the Northlands, the Sagas of Nog and the Nog. Apparently, this was a game created in the 1960s. And now they're creating a small expansion to it 60 years later. Doesn't really explain much about the gameplay, so I guess it's famous, maybe? Uh, there's just enough people out there to fund it. So if you're one of them, if you've been missing it, then uh, here you go. 
It has a, a neat, uh, looks like it was hand drawn by a child kind of style to it. A little more complicated on the newer cards, but um, if this was a famous game, I have no idea. But it very well could be. Uh, it's in the UK and maybe it was famous there. Um, I don't know if you can get the original game either, but uh, if you have a copy of it, maybe this is a good time for you to get a little more fun out of it. Then we have an arena game. This one is Greek mythology based. It is Seven Fortunes, the Greek mythology edition for two to six players. And mainly it's about cards. You don't battle with miniatures, so it's a little different than a lot of other things that have come out. Uh, art is pretty good on the cards. Art on tokens and all that is kind of generic. So whatever it is you feel um, is most important to you, then you can pick it up. I am not that really into uh, the arena type games. Uh, nothing has really pulled me in. And um, I don't know, just the, the overall style and everything, it never appealed to me. I don't really play MOBAs or anything like that either. But there's no reason in the world why you shouldn't jump on this. It has some stuff artwork-wise It looks like it was generated in 3D, like the cover there, and what I believe is Hephaestus there on the bottom, but uh, the other digital paint assets, uh, as you can see with Zeus himself and Dionysus and then Mercury, uh, or Hermes, whichever one you want to pick for a name, those look pretty good all on their own. So I see some Cyclops, some other cool stuff as well uh, out there in the cards. So it's a, it's a pretty thorough expansion of all the different things you can do based on uh, the early Greek mythologies. And then I'm probably not going to be too fair to this game because a lot of people have pet peeves, and for me, one of them is Jane Austen. I can't stand her books. They're all just about getting a rich husband. There's nothing else that really goes on. Um, I, I know a lot of people, they hail her work and this, that, and the other thing, but I just think they all send the wrong message. <laughs> They're not about getting a job. They're not about working hard. They're not about being a good person. They're about... Getting rich through marriage, and that's what all the characters seem to come out to for me. I've had to teach it before, and I've never felt like more of a whore than trying to make these uh, folks, these terrible, terrible rich folks, uh, seem like they're important or some type of thing to emulate, because uh, that's what I was getting paid to do. The, you know, This game probably has nothing to do with that, but it's about finding husbands in a Jane Austen world, so... It probably is just about finding a rich husband, which, you know, few things are more truly deplorable than that. Discounting a person's entire being and finding them uh, just based on wealth. Like, all right, just put yourself down as a, it's, it's prostitution. That's what it is. I'm just not into it. It's just a less honest version of it. At least do an honest version of it if that's what you're going to do. Next up we have Numpty, and that's what you may think I am after uh, my critique of Jane Austen there, but this is a different style. This is about corporate warfare and throwing your friends under the bus, very similar to Zero Inbox. So if you did pick up Zero or Inbox Zero, then uh, maybe this is another one that you'd want to play. This one's uh, out of New Zealand. It's a little more friendly because they're more friendly folk, um, but they're trying to be as cutthroat as possible, and they have all these different cards that uh, emulate what a corporate structure is about and uh, you know try and take people down so if you're a fan of the movies wall street uh, or anything of that ilk then uh, maybe this is for you and maybe you want to pick up inbox zero as well then we have your friend is sad which probably describes everyone in the world except if you own a dog and have no other friends in which case the dog is always happy because dogs are dogs and they are amazing these are things you can do to try to cheer up your friend. So it's a competitive way to try to make people happy. Interesting concept. As you can see, there is a dog right there. It gives you affection. And uh, you can have nostalgia. And I think they're, they've missed the point of nostalgia. Nostalgia, at a certain point, was actually considered a mental disorder. So... You know, you can look into that one on the Cabinet of Curiosities or the Lore podcast. Has, uh, last one I heard a really good story about that. Um, they have challenges. The big meanie that, uh, you know, tries to stop you from doing the things that you want to do and makes you have to do the things that you have to do. Uh, and then there's all the things that you want to do, like apple picking, cooking, and water park. Sure, throw all that fun stuff together and uh, you'd have yourself a good time. 
if you are going to have a good time making other feels other people feel good, then this may be the game for you. The simple art style, but I don't think it's anything that you wouldn't find on Bears vs. Babies or any of those other Maddenman things. They're very similar in uh, feel, not necessarily in quality. Then we have Airships, the North Pole Quest. So if you're a fan of Zeppelins, if you have ever thought of going to the Arctic Circle, then this is a pretty cool... Uh, a way to run through 1924 trying to get yourself to that very very tip top of uh, the world so the maps look pretty cool the, the cars and everything look pretty neat everything looks very stylish and uh, you get to uh, to run around in the, the different types of uh, blimps so I wonder if the Arctic air uh, was much of a factor if they're probably running on hydrogen in 1924 so I can imagine it might not have been too bad uh, but definitely the wind speed so see how those mechanics fit in and, uh, you know, play yourself through the Roaring Twenties. Because uh, that was right there smack in the middle of all of the fun, good flapper times. And I do not know why they have this as communist cats, because cats are all in it for themselves. Chairman Meow is not going to uh, put together anything for the people or the kitties. They do it all for themselves. As you can see, there's also a fat mouse somewhere in there, and uh, you have lots of different uh, interesting sides to be. You can be part of the revolution, you can try to negotiate, you can be a theorist, a commander, a general, or just a fancy cat in a suit. So, I know there's a lot of people that probably like the art style pretty well. Uh, I just didn't think that it tied in. Uh, it was kind of gimmicky in the idea, because, like I said, they're, sol they're solitary hunters. They're not pack hunters. Now, if you put dogs in here... Because they uh, are pack uh, animals, then it would make a lot more sense to me. But uh, go with what's cute, go what you like, that part's up to you. You start the game with a couple cards, and then you draw some cards, and you play some cards, and you do everything you can to gain influence. Capture the mouse, or destroy your opponents. Just get to the chairmanship, and then you'll win. So, if that's something that sounds like it'd be fun for you, run for the kitties, comrade. Then we have a game that may become less and less in good taste. Uh, last year we had the crazy Australian fires. The Brazilian rainforest is still on fire. I guarantee you within a month or two, California is going to be in another record fire season. Um, this is Fire Tower, and it is about nature being on fire and doing your best to uh, push the blaze towards your opponents instead of towards yourself. So... Um, they have some types of birds that somehow can also uh, create fires and do different things. There are gems and other things that you may want to use in other games as replacements for more inferior tokens. So I would throw that in as a possible uh, use for all this. Otherwise, it is not terribly expensive. $42 for the regular game and $28 for the deluxe expansion. There are a lot more expensive games out here. So... It is in its second printing, which is what this is, which means a lot of people have enjoyed it before you. If you want to join in with them, Fire Tower, the Rising Flames expansion, is available. Then we have IT Startup, which is very similar to what do I do in a day job. I sit there and I, I quality control stuff. And it's got lots of cool stuff that you would find when looking out for someone. See, QA Wizard Engineer. There, right there in the corner. That's someone like what I do. Uh, full stack ninja research engineer those are people that we all want debugging is what i end up doing technical debt ooh, that is uh is very uh very much what it feels like to uh to have all that corporate paper after you monster bug that you have to fight down yep 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 check all those off it is definitely an it based adventure game and not just something that is going to try to be super nerdy about everything. It is more about those constant perils. Uh, I feel it reminds me of the Illuminati game that I saw in the mid-90s. Um, just because you have all these uh, strange, terrible things that could be out there in the world. And they're all trying to attack the thing that you love, such as your company. And those are the vectors which you're going to be attacked by. So, uh, yeah. I think it's a neat uh, little game. It doesn't have a lot of super complex pieces along with it, but the card art is nice. It seems to be fun and thematic. Even if it's black and white, it's easy to see and easy to play. Then we have a sci-fi dice 
game. This is Merchants of Quilta, and uh, it says that it has a unique dice manipulation mechanism. Um, maybe it does, in that you can re-roll things, which uh, can be very annoying when you're playing some other types of games. Um, if you're just getting something totally useless and there's nothing else you can do. You have to somehow get a higher result, I think. So if you rolled a 1, then you can keep rolling until you hit 6. Uh, and that might be uh, useful to you, or it might not, depending on the type of merchant you're going to use at the time. Lots of alien beings, lots of interesting things to be there. There's some type of uh, cross between a gerbil and uh, a bunny, and I guess they're both rodents, right? And then you have your uh, praying mantis types, and your groots, and chameleons, and minotaurs with brain suckers attached to them. There's a lot of things going on. So if you need something to be representative of all the things that you could find in one of those, uh, you know, dens of scum and villainy, then might not be part of the Merchants of Kulta. And then the last campaign I could fit into this is the War of the Spike Limited Edition Spike Feeders Playmat, which you can also pick up some dice that look like cacti on them. Um, this is for Magic the Gathering or any other game that you want to play. If you like the idea of having this snow cactus attacking people, um, you've got flying paladins and dragons, and you have possibly some zombies uh, thrown into the mix, maybe a lich or a wraith, whatever you want to, to see it as. That part is all fun and good. Lots of monsters and things to fight those monsters. But if you don't like this, then don't buy it. <laughs> uh, there's not a lot of other options available. Um, but like I said, they do have the dice and a few other things. They're not really going for a whole lot. I'm not sure if this is a famous icon of some uh, form uh, to have this cactus deal or if it's just something they were trying to throw out there to, uh, to get people uh, involved in it. So if you do know what it is, you can throw that in the comments. You can also hit like and subscribe because that'll be helpful. This here is the end of the coverage. I tried to talk as fast as I could to get through it, but to keep you awake, to keep me awake, because we still have another video that you may or may not have watched already for the RPG side of stuff. Lots of cool things are in there, and you should check those creators out. Uh, I think we got pretty far caught up, but I did not get everything that's in July already, and obviously more is going to pop in, as it is only the second week of June, and uh, next week is Father's Day. Lots of folks are getting the day off on the 19th, and if your company wants to do that as well, that would be awesome. Join in on that effort um, just to make things nice for the people out there that uh, want to remember things in a good way and want to see some progress going forward. Uh, and who doesn't want a day off from work? You get paid for, right? Think about that for a little bit. Uh, something to reflect on. Anything else to reflect on is if you've hit that subscribe button, if you want to help me out because you like this type of coverage, you want to know uh, all the cool stuff that's out there, you like someone who makes it easy for you to jump ahead and uh, not have to sit through a whole 45 minute video if you don't want to, hey, what do we can, you do what you can, try to make the world a better place, play some games, be happy, enjoy your weekend, and I guess I'll see you guys on the next round, and uh, Maybe I'll be around for Father's Day. Maybe I won't. We'll see how things go uh, if I'm not around. It's because I'm taking my dad to dinner. I'm sure you'll be cool with that.